In the Age of Sail era, cannon sizes were classified in the weight of pounds, not in the form of the cannons themselves, but in the form of their projectiles. The largest iron ball that could fit down the bore of a cannon's barrel was then weighed and then the weight of that ball in pounds determined the cannon size rating. Typical cannons on the ships in the Age of Sail ranged from 1 pounder bronze falconets in the 17th century to 68 pounder cannons in the mid 19th century. Welcome to Random Military History. Fast forward to the 20th century, the infamous large machine gun calibre cartridge, the 50 BMG designed by John Browning, was in fact made by simply upscaling a 30 odd 6 cartridge by 66% in every dimension. It also has 14,000 foot pounds of kinetic energy out of a typical Barrett or M2 Browning barrel. Let's see us in action. Rewind way back to the European Iron Age of 800 BC. It began not as a result of discovering iron and declaring it superior to bronze, but as a result of running out of tin to make bronze, forcing them to use iron to make their weapons and tools instead. Why is this? Because iron is actually an inferior material than bronze to make weapons and tools. Although it is heavier and stronger, it is also significantly more brittle than the relatively ductile bronze. Meaning, if the material's maximum strength is exerted, it is significantly more likely to shatter completely, whereas bronze warps and bends and can be repaired by bending it back into shape. Throughout the age of the sword and spear, swords are often portrayed in media as highly effective for cutting through armour. In reality, this couldn't be further from the truth, because swords have poor inertia retention as the centre of mass is closer to the crossguard, and the fin blade flexes tremendously when striking targets. Swords were so bad at penetrating armour, in fact, that skilled swordsmen of various periods were trained to flip the sword around and use the crossguard as a makeshift warhammer, or grip the sword halfway down the blade to add strength to poke holes between the gaps. These two techniques were known as half-swording and mortal. Fast forward to World War II, oil was arguably the most critical and decisive logistical resource of the war, because it was the lifeblood of the new mechanized technology developed in the war, being absolutely essential for the Air Force and Navy, and unless you want your logistics to be horse-drawn, the Army as well. And it was not something that all nations in World War II had, oh no. In fact, at the time, the United States produced 70% of the world's oil production. By comparison, Germany produced just 3% and Japan 0.4. Just looking at these numbers, it becomes quite self-evident why the Allies won. In the Vietnam War, there were all sorts of weird weapons and projects that were outgrowths of technology invented in World War II. One of them was this monstrosity, the M50 Ontos. It was designed as a tank destroyer with a mere 300 made, but it is arguably the most effective artillery platform for its weight in the entire war. At just 8.6 tons, it could be airlifted by helicopter and cross pontoon bridges, all with six 105mm recoilless rifles able to spew out a whopping 59 kilograms of shells in one salvo. Let's see it in action. back to the American Civil War, the standard issue rifles of both sides were still muzzle-loading rifles that have been used for the last 300 years. But new technology in regards to ammunition finally allowed for the creation of the first high-capacity breech loaders, the Lever Action Spencer and Henry rifles. The Spencer had a slower rate of fire and less than half of the ammo capacity that the Henry did at just 7 rounds versus 15. But the Spencer fired a round twice as powerful than the Henry at 1,100 foot-pounds at the muzzle versus 570. Because both fired so much faster than the standard muzzle loader at the time anyway, combined with a huge preference on stopping power, the Spencer was much more successful, with 200,000 produced versus the Henry's just 14,000. Thanks for watching. Episode 3 should be coming out in a few weeks. I've got a lot on my plate at the moment. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like the video and share it with as many people as you can. See you guys.